Introduction Diabetes is the ultimate self-help disease. When first diagnosed, you may be overwhelmed with questions. How did I get this? Will my children get it too? Does it mean I can't eat anything I used to eat? Can I still work? How sick will I get? Am I going to go blind? Will I have to have a limb amputated? Am I going to die? Can I just ignore it and hope it will go away? But the most fundamental question to ask is this. How can I help myself? Because the reality of diabetes is that it is a chronic and progressive disease that can lead to complications, sometimes the frightening complications mentioned earlier. But the reality, too, is its striking characteristic as a self-help disease because, armed with appropriate information and support from your diabetic medical team, you will be able to prevent or delay most complications. You cannot cure diabetes, but you can care for yourself in such a way that you can live a long and healthy life. And what you need to do doesn't involve magic. It involves what we all need to do, take good care of ourselves whether or not we are diabetic. This book will arm you with some of that information. You will learn about what causes diabetes and who is at risk of developing it, and you will learn about new research to prevent and perhaps someday cure this disease. You'll learn about prediabetes and what can be done to see that it does not result in a later diagnosis of diabetes. You will be able to identify both symptoms of diabetes and possible complications if you have diabetes. But most importantly, you will learn about the treatment of diabetes. Through careful testing, medications, and lifestyle changes, exercise, diet, stress control, diabetes can be well controlled in most cases. Complications can be prevented or delayed for most diabetics. Finally, you will be invited to develop a new attitude toward your health, both mental and physical. Diabetes can be a frightening diagnosis, but it can also be a second chance to live a long and healthy life. The choice is yours to make. Chapter 1. What is Diabetes? Diabetes is actually four separate conditions, type 1, type 2, gestational, and prediabetes. All of these involve inadequate levels of or resistance to insulin. Because of this, the body is unable to use food as energy. It can lead to serious complications, but with proper care, all of these conditions can be controlled so that such complications are less likely to result. Our bodies change the food we eat into glucose or sugar through a process of digestion. Sugar travels through the body in the blood. Some of this sugar is used for energy as the body's main fuel source, and some is stored in muscles in the liver for later use. Excess sugar is made into fat and stored throughout the body. Beta cells in the pancreas are responsible for producing the hormone insulin, which allows sugar to be used for energy and for storage, unlocking cells throughout the body to allow glucose to enter as fuel. In diabetes, either the pancreas produces insufficient insulin or cells in the body are resistant to the insulin produced. Because of this, sugar remains in the blood, leading to high blood sugar levels. This sugar builds up, and the excess is responsible for complications, including diseases of the heart, eye, kidney, nerves, and other organs. In type 1 diabetes, previously called insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, or juvenile onset diabetes, the body's immune system destroys the beta cells located in the pancreas. The pancreas is unable to produce any insulin, and the hormone must be delivered from outside of the body through an injection or a pump. This condition is most common among children and young adults, but can occur at any age. Approximately 5 to 10 percent of all diagnosed cases of diabetes are type 1. In type 2 diabetes, previously called non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus or adult-onset diabetes, the usual cause of high sugar in the blood is due to insulin resistance. Cells do not respond to insulin and are unable to absorb glucose. Because the insulin is not able to be used, the pancreas continues to produce it at high rates, and often type 2 diabetics maintain a high level of insulin in their blood. Eventually, though, the pancreas is unable to meet the demand, and gradually loses its ability to produce insulin. Type 2 diabetes accounts for 90 to 95 percent of all diagnosed cases. Gestational diabetes, diagnosed in some women during pregnancy, involves the inability to process glucose. After pregnancy, 5 to 10 percent of women are found to have type 2 diabetes, and 20 to 50 percent of those who have had gestational diabetes will develop type 2 diabetes at some time in their lives. 
Prediabetes, formerly called borderline diabetes, is a condition prior to diabetes where patients have marked metabolic difficulties. If not treated, these are likely to lead to type 2 diabetes. This will be discussed further in the chapter on prevention. There are 20.8 million diabetics in the United States, 7% of the overall population. Of these, approximately one-third are unaware they have the condition and are therefore untreated and at higher risk for complications. In addition, 41 million people are considered pre-diabetic. Direct and indirect medical costs, including disability, work loss, and premature mortality, cost the United States approximately $40 billion a year. About one in every 400 to 600 children is diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Overall, only 2% of people under 20 years of age have diabetes. About 20% of all people over 60 have diabetes, with men slightly more represented in this group, about 1.5% higher. Risk factors include race and ethnicity. About 9% of non-Hispanic whites and 13% of non-Hispanic blacks have diabetes. Hispanic and Latino individuals are 1.7 times more likely to have diabetes than non-Hispanic whites. American Indians and Alaska Natives have a 15% chance of developing diabetes. The highest percentages in this group are the American Indians in the southern United States and Arizona at over 26%. American Indians and Alaska Natives are 2.2 times more likely to have diabetes than non-Hispanic whites. Increased prevalence of diabetes is also shown for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Diabetes is the sixth leading cause of death on U.S. death certificates. This is likely to be underreported as the underlying cause of death. The risk of death among people with diabetes is about twice that of people of similar age who do not have diabetes. Risk factors for type 2 diabetes. Risk factors include being over 45 years old, although more children are now being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes than ever before. Family history of diabetes. Physical inactivity. Overweight. 80% of people diagnosed with type 2 diabetes are overweight. High blood pressure and high cholesterol. High stress. Previous gestational diabetes. Aboriginal, Hispanic, Asian, or African descent. Impaired fasting glucose. 110 to 125 milligrams a deciliter indicates prediabetes. Over 126 indicates diabetes. Impaired glucose tolerance. 140 to 199 milligrams a deciliter indicates prediabetes. Over 200 indicates diabetes. The more risk factors an individual has, the greater the chance of developing type 2 diabetes. Is there a cure? Research into preventing and or curing diabetes is ongoing. At this time, prevention includes treating close relatives of people with diabetes to determine if certain medications can prevent diabetes in those at a higher risk of developing it. The only known cure for type 1 diabetes involves transplanting the pancreas so that the patient can again produce insulin. The surgery and its effects can be difficult, and the immune system must be repressed to avoid rejection of these cells. Other research in this area involves transplanting the insulin-producing cells, islet cells, within the pancreas, developing an artificial pancreas, or genetic manipulation by inserting normal human insulin genes into cells of the pancreas. The islet cell transplant procedure, known as the Edmonton Protocol, has brought hope that type 1 diabetics may eventually eliminate the need for artificial insulin. Although there is no known cure at this time for type 2 diabetes, research continues to focus on controlling the condition so that complications of the disease may be avoided and diabetics can live long and healthy lives. It is known that heredity plays a factor in type 2 diabetes, but there is a strong interplay of environmental factors, such as weight and inactivity, that lead to its development. One interesting theory postulates that type 2 diabetes derives from normal genetic actions once important for survival. In certain nomadic populations at times of low food supplies, hormones are released that lead to insulin resistance so that the body can store sugar for future needs. Because of Western diets, this is no longer needed, but the body continues to create a condition in which the cells are resistant to insulin. This might explain the high incidence of diabetes in Native American tribes with nomadic histories. Chapter 2. Prevention of Diabetes Discussions of prevention center on stopping the process of pre-diabetes from developing into full-blown diabetes. Described as a train trip, each stop or development along the way leads to further complications. Often, inactivity and a sedentary lifestyle, as well as weight gain, lead to metabolic abnormalities. These include high blood pressure, 
poor cholesterol levels, poor triglyceride levels, abdominal obesity, and resistance to insulin. Any three of these indicators signify metabolic syndrome, which involves a higher risk of heart attack, stroke, and diabetes. Microvascular complications are the result of increased blood sugar and include eye disease, retinopathy, kidney disease, nephropathy, and nerve disease, neuropathy. Macrovascular complications include heart disease, stroke, and disorders of circulation, especially in the limbs. Preventing type 2 diabetes involves making changes in your lifestyle. Rising glucose levels in prediabetes, as well as other aspects of the metabolic syndrome, can be reduced to normal levels, often without medication. The changes are simple and involve modest exercise and diet changes for many. Research has shown that increasing activity by adding 30 minutes of moderate walking per day can decrease the risk of developing diabetes by 47% over a one-year period. Exercise promotes weight loss and decreases both blood pressure and cholesterol. It also reduces stress and increases overall health and fitness. And it can be as simple as walking whenever you can, parking farther from the store entrance, and trying new activities and sports. Losing just 7% of your body weight over a period of two years will decrease your chances of developing diabetes by 30%, and your food changes do not need to be drastic. Roast and poach meats when you can, use lemon and spices to add flavor to your food, and eat more fruit and vegetables. Moderation, not deprivation, is the key. Eat a variety of foods and make small changes in your food choices. Increase your intake of the less processed grains, cereal fibers, and lentils. These foods raise blood sugar slowly and are preferable to more finely processed foods which raise blood sugar more quickly. Lifestyle changes can prevent progression to diabetes. In one study, dietary modification including a low-calorie meal plan with reduced fat intake and moderate intensity activity of 150 minutes per week resulted in a 58% reduction in the number of those who progressed from prediabetes to diabetes in four years, even with only modest weight losses. Chapter 3, Symptoms and Diagnosis of Diabetes. The symptoms of type 1 diabetes often come on very suddenly and can be very severe. They include being exceptionally thirsty, needing to urinate often, extreme weight loss, although hungry and eating well, weakness and fatigue, or blurry vision. Often people with type 2 diabetes have few symptoms, if any, at the start. In other cases, the symptoms are experienced so gradually that they remain unnoticed. The symptoms include blurry vision, slow healing of cuts and sores, frequent infections, itchy skin, frequent yeast infections, increased thirst, dry mouth, needing to urinate often, muscle cramps especially in the legs, tingling and numbness in hands and feet, dry skin, fatigue, irritability, or unexplained weight loss. Because early diabetic symptoms are often missed, most diabetics have had the disease for over eight years before they are diagnosed. For this reason, doctors are now screening for diabetes regularly, particularly in older patients. They suggest screening all people over 40 years of age with a fasting blood glucose test every three years. This involves fasting with no food and drink for eight hours before the test. A test result of between 100 to 125 milligrams per deciliter after an overnight fast indicates prediabetes while a test result over 126 milligrams per deciliter indicates diabetes. More frequent testing if an individual has a higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes, including the oral glucose tolerance test. This involves giving the patient a special sweetened drink prior to the test. A test result of between 140 and 199 milligrams per deciliter two hours after administering the drink indicates prediabetes. If the result is over 200, the individual is diagnosed with diabetes. This test should be administered to anyone in the following high-risk categories. Has a first-degree relative with diabetes. Is a member of a high-risk population. Aboriginal, Hispanic, Asian, South Asian, or African descent has a history of impaired glucose tolerance or impaired fasting blood glucose results or prediabetes, has heart disease, has a history of gestational diabetes, or has high blood pressure or high cholesterol. Chapter 4, Complications of Diabetes. Diabetes affects the whole body, and it is possible to experience many complications from the disease throughout the blood vessels of the body. With appropriate meal and exercise plans, medications, regular visits to your doctor, 
and regular testing of your blood sugars to evaluate the effects of your actions on control of your sugar levels, you will be able to prevent or delay such complications. Complications you may experience include cardiovascular disease. Caused by hardening of the arteries, this can lead to increased blood pressure, strokes, and heart attacks. Neuropathy. Uncontrolled or poorly controlled diabetes can lead to nerve damage, especially in limbs. Particular care of the feet is important, especially if feeling in this area is diminished because of nerve damage. Retinopathy. This can result in eye damage caused by damage to blood vessels in the back of the eye. Again, by keeping blood sugars in a normal range, the risk of this complication can be lowered. Regular checkups by an ophthalmologist, a doctor specializing in diseases of the eye, will track any changes in your eyes caused by diabetes. Nephropathy. The kidneys are made up of tiny blood vessels that filter and purify blood. When the kidneys are damaged, protein and microalbumin will show up in urine tests regularly scheduled by your doctor. Complications are more likely to arise if you have poor or little control over your diabetes, have elevated blood pressure or high cholesterol, smoke, are obese, are inactive, and have a family history of complications. The best prevention is to stop smoking, increase exercise, and lose weight if needed. It is that simple, and it has a major effect in preventing complications. Every percentage point drop in A1C blood test results reduces the risk of eye, kidney, and nerve complications by 40%. Blood pressure control reduces the risk of heart disease and stroke by 33 to 50% and improved control of cholesterol can reduce cardiovascular complications by 20 to 50 percent. If complications are detected early enough, their effects can be reduced. Detecting and treating diabetic eye disease can reduce the development of severe vision loss by an estimated 50 to 60 percent. Comprehensive foot care programs can reduce amputation rates by 45 to 85 percent. Gum disease is also more common in people with diabetes. About one-third of people with diabetes have severe periodontal disease. With regular visits to the dentist, this complication can be minimized or eliminated. In summary, many complications do result from poorly controlled diabetes. The entire body is affected by the changes brought on by this disease. But it is also affected by the care you give your body. Complications are not inevitable for most people with diabetes. It involves a commitment to keeping yourself healthy with diet, exercise, and awareness of blood sugar levels through regular testing and appropriate and consistent medical care. Avoiding complications is largely in your own hands. Chapter 5, Taking Care, Medications. The goal of medication is to improve the metabolism of glucose and prevent elevations of glucose in the blood. The first steps in treatment include changes in diet and exercise. Exercise especially has been shown to improve insulin sensitivity. Medications attack diabetes where it starts, where resistance takes place, the liver, fat, and muscles. Insulin sensitizers which address the basic problem of resistance include metformin, actos, and avandia. Other medications serve to promote insulin release. Developed before the sensitizers, these medications have been around a long time. They include diabinase, glucotrol, and diabeta. Also called sulfonylureas, these drugs move insulin out of the cells that produce it, thus improving the body's ability to get glucose where it is needed. A third category of medications stimulate insulin secretion quickly and must be taken strictly at mealtime. They include Prandin and Starlix. Carbohydrate blockers must be taken immediately after a meal and include Precos and Glycet. These medications are often prescribed early on in the course of the disease. By delaying absorption of carbohydrates, they may give the body a better chance to naturally produce insulin. In some cases, diabetes is treated with diet and lifestyle changes alone. For many, the addition of medications such as the ones mentioned above can help an individual to maintain control over blood sugar levels. When such control is not attained with oral medications, the doctor may prescribe insulin, which is administered via injection or pump. This is sometimes used in conjunction with oral medications. Among adults with diagnosed diabetes, 15% rely on diet and exercise to control their disease. Another 57% take oral medication only, 12% take both insulin and oral medication, and 16% rely on insulin only. Insulin cannot be taken by mouth because it would be destroyed by digestion. Instead, most people who need insulin take insulin shots. 
Other ways to take insulin include insulin pens, insulin jet injectors, and insulin pumps. There are two types of insulin, slow-acting and rapid-acting. Slow-acting begins to work 1 to 2 hours after it is injected, and its peak effect is 8 to 12 hours after the injection. Fast-acting works 1 half to 1 hour after injection, with its peak at 2 to 3 hours. Insulin must be injected into the fat, and the location site must be changed daily. Both types must be stored in the refrigerator and allowed to attain room temperature for about one half hour before they are injected. Be aware of expiry dates. Most insulin can remain for up to two years if it is stored unopened in the refrigerator, three months if it's open, and one month at room temperature. Chapter 6. Taking Care. Natural Remedies. There has been considerable interest in identifying natural minerals and herbal remedies which may control or alleviate diabetes and its complications. Helpful minerals include calcium. It has been hypothesized that ample levels of calcium help control and prevent high blood pressure, often a complication of diabetes. Chromium. Chromium works in the body to help turn carbohydrates into glucose and helps to regulate the hormone insulin. Sources of chromium include brewer's yeast, nuts, cheese, whole grains, oysters, and mushrooms. Research indicates that supplementing the body with chromium can improve glucose tolerance, enhance insulin secretion, reduce high sugar levels in gestational diabetes, lower cholesterol levels, and encourage the loss of body fat. Vanadium. Vanadium is described as a building material of bones and teeth, and it is also associated with glucose regulation. It acts much like insulin in the body and enhances its effects. Food sources include skim milk, lobster, vegetables, vegetable oils, butter, and cheese. Research shows that it can improve sugar levels and enhance insulin sensitivity in type 2 diabetics, as well as lowering insulin requirements in type 1 diabetics. The use of plants to treat diabetes has been known throughout history, and in fact a modern drug, metformin, originated from French lilac, is an herb used to treat diabetes since medieval times. In many cultures, herbs are an accepted part of diabetic treatment. Some of the most commonly used herbs include Gymnema sylvester. Derived from the leaves of a tree native to Africa and India, it is best known for its ability to abolish the taste of sweetness. The Hindu name for this herb is Gurmar, which means sugar killer. It interferes with your ability to taste sweetness. Research shows it can boost the production and activity of insulin and reduce both blood sugar and blood fat levels. It is hypothesized that it does this by revitalizing beta cells in the pancreas, thus increasing the production of insulin. Cinnamon. Derived from the bark of the laurel tree, it has been shown to make fat cells more responsive to insulin. In a test tube experiment with fat cells, it was shown to increase the conversion of glucose to energy by 20. Fenugreek. The fenugreek plant produces seeds that have long been used as restorative remedy, particularly to treat loss of appetite, digestive problems, and skin inflammation. The seeds are rich in fiber and have been shown to lower blood sugar. General research into alternative remedies for diabetes suggests the following may be helpful. Type 1 diabetes. Chromium, under supervision of a doctor, to improve glucose tolerance. High fiber diet, whole grains, beans, vegetables, and fruit, and consider taking a fiber supplement as well, such as psyllium or guar gum. Protect against diabetic complications such as nerve and kidney damage with alpha-lipoic acid. Help relieve pain from diabetic neuropathy by adding a supplement of evening primrose oil. Type 2 diabetes. Ensure good nutrition with a daily multivitamin, which may also serve to prevent common infections. Chromium, under supervision of a doctor to improve glucose tolerance. High fiber diet, whole grains, beans, vegetables, and fruit, and consider taking a fiber supplement as well, such as psyllium or guar gum. Use a topical ointment containing capsaicin to help control nerve pain. Use alpha-lipoic acid to improve insulin sensitivity and help protect against diabetic nerve damage. Chapter 7, Taking Care, Diabetic Glucose Level Testing. Blood sugar testing is an important component of both your self-care and the care provided to you by your doctor. It will help you both to learn what your glucose levels are throughout the day and over several months. It can teach you how your body reacts to lifestyle and medication changes and guide you in fine-tuning those changes. A1C test, doctor administered. Your doctor should perform an A1C test, also known as glycated hemoglobin test, every three to six months. It measures your average blood sugar level over the past two to three months 
and is a way of assessing overall diabetes control and predicting the possibility of complications from diabetes. It can give you an idea of how well your treatment plan is working. Hemoglobin is found within red blood cells where it carries oxygen from the lungs to all the cells of the body. Like all proteins, it links up with glucose. The more excess glucose in your blood, the more hemoglobin links with this glucose. This test measures the amount of glucose within these cells and gives you an overview of your average blood glucose control. The amount of glycated, linked with glucose hemoglobin, reflects approximately 120 days of sugar control, or the lifespan of a red blood cell. In a non-diabetic person, about 5% of all hemoglobin is glycated. Although the target for most patients with diabetes is 7%, in non-control diabetics, this number may go as high as 25%. This test does not replace daily self-testing of your diabetic control, but it helps to give a good overview of how medication, diet, and exercise are contributing to your overall health as a diabetic. Self-monitoring of blood glucose, SMBG. Using a blood glucose monitor to do regular testing can improve control of your blood sugar levels by helping you to make appropriate adjustments to your medicine, diet, and level of physical activity. Although your doctor will advise you on how often you should test, common frequencies are type 1 diabetes and taking insulin three to four times a day, type 2 diabetes and taking insulin and oral medication three to four times a day, type 2 diabetes and oral medication with a higher than target A1C test result two to four times a day, type 2 diabetes and oral medication with target A1C test result or control with diet and exercise only, ask your doctor how often you should test. To test you will need a glucose meter, alcohol pads, sterile finger lancets, and test strips. Many health insurance plans will pay for your glucose meter. Some meters store results in memory so that you can compare results from several days. Others can be hooked up to your computer to analyze your results. In order to measure the amount of blood glucose or sugar in your blood at a given time, the procedure is as follows. 1. Wash your hands with soap, rinse, and dry them thoroughly. 2. Use an alcohol pad to clean the area you are going to prick. With most meters, you can use a drop of blood obtained from your fingertip. 3. Prick yourself with a sterile lancet to get a drop of blood. It may be less painful to prick the side rather than the pad of the finger. 4. Place the drop of blood on the test strip. Washing your hands in hot water and then dangling your hand below heart level may make it easier to obtain a sufficient amount to register for the test. You may also try squeezing your finger from the base to the tip, not at the site itself. 5. Most meters will give you a number for your blood sugar level in 5 to 10 seconds. You may choose to keep a daily log to record your test results. It should include the time you took the test, the result, and any notes concerning changes in diet, exercise, or stress level that may account for the variation in readings. Be sure to bring the log with you when you visit your doctor. Although your ideal blood glucose range will be unique as determined by your doctor and may change throughout the day, common standards are fasting prior to breakfast, 70 milligrams a deciliter to 120 milligrams a deciliter, before meals, 90 milligrams a deciliter to 130 milligrams a deciliter, before bedtime snack, less than 180 milligrams a deciliter. Taking your sugar levels at different times throughout the day can help you to make decisions on daily self-care. Your fasting blood sugar level can be used to adjust medication or long-acting insulin. Levels taken before a meal can help guide you in modifying your upcoming meal or medication. Taking a level one to two hours after a meal will teach you how food affects your sugar values. These readings are likely to be the highest levels of the day. Finally, by taking a sugar level at bedtime, prior to a bedtime snack, you can adjust your diet or medication for the next eight hours. Other reasons to check your blood sugar include when you have symptoms of low blood sugar or hypoglycemia. These can include dizziness, shaking, sweating, chills, and confusion when you have symptoms of high blood sugar or hyperglycemia that can include sleepiness, blurred vision, frequent urination, and excessive thirst. When you want to know how particular foods, physical activity, or medications are affecting your blood sugar level. When you need to determine that your blood sugar is controlled for safety considerations. To help you decide if it is safe to drive or perform other tasks, especially if you have experienced hypoglycemia in the past or are taking insulin. You may increase the frequency of your glucose level tests when you have changed your diabetes medication, are beginning other medications, change your diet, change your physical activity level, increase your stress level, 
or when you are sick. Sometimes, even without eating, your sugar levels may rise when you are ill. It is important to work with your doctor in order to determine your blood glucose target range and frequency of testing. Blood glucose testing results are information, and along with maintaining a healthy diet, an active lifestyle, and medication can help you to effectively control your diabetes. Remember, the test results are not about passing or failing. They can serve as a guide to help teach you about your body's reactions to lifestyle and medication changes. They can help you to help yourself. Chapter 8, Taking Care, Keeping Active. Being active is one of the best things you can do to improve your overall health. It can lower your blood glucose by reducing resistance to insulin, lower your blood pressure, help you lose weight or maintain your target weight, help you to generally feel better, make it possible for you to need less medication, relieve tension and stress, improve the functioning of your body, particularly your heart and lungs, and improve your muscle tone. It is recommended that people with type 2 diabetes should engage in at least 150 minutes of moderate aerobic activity per week. This can include such activities as brisk walking, cycling, and dancing. They require that you breathe more deeply and make your heart work harder. Resistance activities three times a week can be added to this to ensure healthy bones and muscle. Small changes in your daily life can have a huge impact on your health. If you start an exercise program, Go slowly and gradually increase the intensity and length of the sessions as your body becomes more fit. Those small changes are a good start. Walk instead of driving whenever possible. Get off the bus one stop early. Take the stairs instead of the elevator. Play with your children, your grandchildren, or your pets. Take up gardening. Regular exercise makes your body more sensitive to insulin. Because of this, your blood sugar level may become too low, hypoglycemia, after exercising. So it's important to check your sugar level both before and after exercise. If it is too low or too high before you begin your exercise, wait until it improves. Be especially aware of sugar levels when you are in extreme temperatures, either too hot or too cold. Temperature changes can affect the way your body absorbs insulin and keep candy or juice on hand to treat hypoglycemia if needed. Also, remember to drink plenty of fluid before, during, and after exercise. Because you may have problems in the nerves in your feet and legs, be sure to wear comfortable shoes and socks when you begin to exercise. Check your feet before and after exercise to make sure you have no blisters or other sores. Be sure to warm up for 5 to 10 minutes with low-intensity exercise and stretch for an additional 5 to 10 minutes before beginning rigorous exercise. At the conclusion of your session, repeat the low-intensity exercise and stretching for a cool-down. This helps your body to adapt to increased demands during your session. Be sure to discuss all exercise programs with your doctor to determine the right activity level for you to help you control your diabetes. Chapter 9, Taking Care, Foot Care. It is especially important to take good care of your feet when you are diabetic. When you have high blood glucose, circulation may be impaired and nerve damage may lead to loss of feeling in your feet. You can prevent problems with your feet by maintaining good blood glucose levels, washing your feet daily with warm water and then patting them dry gently, checking your feet every day for sores, injuries, blisters, breaks in the skin or callus buildup, changes in color, temperature or smell, wearing shoes with good support and socks that do not hurt your feet, not walking barefoot cutting toenails straight across, using lotion on your soles to prevent dry and cracked skin, avoiding crossing your legs or kneeling for long periods of time, and avoiding using heating pads or hot water bottles to warm your feet. Chapter 10, Taking Care, Skin, Teeth, and Eyes. Taking Care of Your Skin. People with diabetes are susceptible to more infections, so it is important to keep skin clean, use skin softeners, and check regularly for minor cuts and bruises. If your blood glucose is high, your body loses fluid and your skin can become dry. Dry skin can be itchy, causing you to scratch and make it sore. Cracks in the skin can allow germs to enter and cause infection, which can become worse with high blood glucose. Areas of concern for such dryness include your legs, feet, and elbows. In addition, nerve damage can decrease the amount you sweat. Decreased sweating in your feet and legs can cause further dryness of the skin. The best ways to care for your skin include wash with a mild soap and make sure you rinse well, particularly under the arms, breasts, between your legs, and between your toes. Keep your skin moist by using a lotion after you wash. Drink lots of fluids to keep your skin moist. Wear all cotton underwear, which allows air to move around your body. 
Check your skin after you wash to make sure you don't have any dry, red, or sore spots that could possibly lead to infection and let your doctor know if you are experiencing any skin problems. Taking care of your teeth. Your dentist should be aware that you have diabetes and need to pay attention to any problems to avoid serious infections. Uncontrolled diabetes impairs white blood cells, which are the body's main defense against bacterial infections that can occur in the mouth. Diabetes increases the risk of dry mouth. High blood glucose levels can decrease saliva flow, which can lead to dry mouth. This in turn can lead to soreness, ulcers, infections, and tooth decay. Gum inflammation. High blood glucose can allow blood vessels to thicken, and this slows the flow of nutrients to tissue and the removal of waste products, particularly in the mouth. This can lead to frequent and severe gum disease. Poor healing of tissues. High blood glucose leads to impaired blood flow to gum tissues that slows healing. Thrush. People with diabetes may frequently take antibiotics to treat infection. Because of this, they are prone to a fungal infection of the mouth and tongue, which thrives on high glucose levels in the saliva of people with uncontrolled diabetes. Diabetic smokers are more than 20 times more likely to develop thrush and periodontal disease than diabetic non-smokers. Along with not smoking, diabetics can maintain dental health by remembering the following guidelines. Keep your blood sugar levels as close to normal as possible. At each visit, inform your dentist of the current status of your diabetic control. Talk to your doctor prior to any scheduled oral surgery or treatment for periodontal disease to determine if changes in your medication need to be made. Inform your dentist of all current medications you are taking. Postpone non-emergency dental procedures if your blood sugar is not in good control. Treat infections such as abscesses immediately. Be aware that healing may take longer for you and follow your dentist's post-treatment guidelines closely. If you are wearing an orthodontic appliance, notify your dentist immediately if the appliance results in a cut to your tongue or mouth. Have your teeth cleaned and checked by your dentist twice a year. Prevent plaque buildup by using dental floss at least once a day. And brush your teeth after every meal. If you wear dentures, remove them and clean them daily. Taking care of the eyes. Eye care is especially important for people with diabetes because they are at risk of developing increased complications. But there are steps you can take to avoid these problems. They include keep your blood sugar levels under tight control. This has been shown to have a significant impact in preventing retinopathy, which affects the blood vessels within the eye. Control blood pressure. Uncontrolled high blood pressure can cause eye problems to worsen. Quit smoking. See your ophthalmologist at least once a year for a dilated eye exam where he administers eye drops prior to his examination. See your eye care professional if your vision becomes blurry, you have trouble reading signs or books, you see double, one or both of your eyes hurt. When your eyes get red, the redness does not go away. You feel pressure in your eye. You see spots or floaters. Straight lines do not look straight. Or your peripheral vision has changed and you do not see things at the side as well as before. Chapter 11, Taking Care, Diet. To control blood glucose, you will need to eat healthy meals at regular times. How much you eat will be determined by your age, weight, and activity level. A dietitian can be a helpful team member in guiding you to care for your diabetes. It is important to eat three meals per day at regular times, spaced no more than six hours apart. Many dietitians suggest interspersing this with small snacks of fruit and whole grains between these meals. A healthy eating schedule can include breakfast at 8 a.m., a fruit snack at 10 a.m., lunch at noon, a fruit snack at 3 p.m., dinner at 6 p.m., and a bedtime snack which includes protein at 9 p.m. Eating at regular times will help to maintain an even blood glucose level throughout the day. Limit sugars and other sweet foods such as regular pop, candy, jam, and honey. Drink water or sugar-free pop. Artificial sweeteners can be useful to avoid adding items which will increase your blood sugar. Check with your doctor. Limit high-fat foods such as fried foods, potato chips, and pastries. High-fat foods lead to weight gain, which is likely to make your cells more resistant to insulin. Eat more high-fiber foods such as whole grain breads and cereals, lentils, dried beans and peas, brown rice, vegetables and fruits with peels left on. Foods high in fiber will make you feel more full and may lower both blood glucose and cholesterol levels. A daily eating plan should include the following. Vegetables. These are high in nutrients and low in calories. Starchy foods such as whole grain breads and cereals, rice, noodles, potatoes at every meal. These foods are broken down into the glucose your body needs for energy. Fish, lean meats, low-fat cheeses, eggs, or vegetarian protein choices. 
Protein helps slow down the digestion of carbohydrates. Milk, fruit. Alcohol can affect your blood glucose and cause weight gain. Ask your doctor whether you can include alcohol in your meal plan. Portion size. When considering portions per meal, a simple guide involves measuring amounts with your hand. Grains and starches. Choose an amount up to the size of your fist. Fruits. Choose an amount up to the size of your fist. Meat and alternatives. Choose an amount up to the size of the palm of your hand and the thickness of your little finger. Vegetables. Choose as much as you can hold in both hands. Fats. Limit fat to an amount the size of the tip of your thumb. Milk and alternatives. Drink up to 8 ounces of low-fat milk with each meal. Carbohydrates are an important part of your daily diet, but not all carbohydrates are the same. Some are quickly broken down in the intestine, while others are turned into sugar more slowly. The glycemic index details how rapidly a particular carbohydrate turns into sugar, and therefore how much it raises blood glucose levels. The higher the number, the quicker response in circulating blood glucose. General guidance using the glycemic index suggests that healthy eating includes plenty of vegetables, fruits, and low-fat milk products with your meals. These foods are rich in carbohydrates, but in general have low glycemic ratings. Low or medium GI foods including whole grain breads or cereals such as oatmeal, long grain or brown rice, pasta and noodles, sweet potatoes or new potatoes, legumes, lentils, chickpeas, kidney beans, split peas, baked beans, or corn, black bean or green pea soup. Because the body digests these foods more slowly, you feel full longer and have more even energy levels. Choose high GI foods less often, including white bread or bagels, cornflakes or Cheerios, short grain rice, baking potatoes or french fries, rice cakes or soda crackers. Consultation with a dietitian for help in choosing low GI foods, adapting recipes, and incorporating low GI foods into your meal plan. It is important to track your own blood sugar levels when following the glycemic index because your body may react differently to some foods than expected. Using the glycemic index is only one part of maintaining a healthy meal plan for yourself. Regular meals with a variety of foods, high in vegetables, fruit, and whole grain products, and low in fat, and moderate in salt and sugar, will provide the nutrition you require without spikes in blood glucose levels. To learn more about methods of choosing a diet plan for your particular needs, contact a dietitian. Chapter 12, Taking Care, Treating Low Blood Sugar, Hypoglycemia. When your blood glucose has dropped below your target range, approximately 70 milligrams a deciliter for fasting level, you experience low blood glucose or hypoglycemia. You may become shaky, lightheaded, irritable, confused, hungry, sweaty, headachy, or weak. You may notice that your heart rate is faster and that you have a numbing or tingling in your tongue or lips. Some of the causes of hypoglycemia include increased physical activity, irregular eating patterns, eating less than you should have, taking too much medication, or drinking alcohol. If your blood glucose drops very low, you may become disoriented and confused or even lose consciousness. You may need assistance from someone, so it is important that you wear identification, which informs that you are a diabetic, such as a medical alert bracelet or necklace. If you think you are experiencing hypoglycemia, check your blood sugar levels immediately. If you are not able to confirm this with a meter, treat the symptoms in any case. You can treat them by eating or drinking a fast-acting carbohydrate, such as 15 grams of glucose in the form of glucose tablets, 3 teaspoons of sugar dissolved in water, 3 quarters of a cup of juice or sweetened soft drink, 6 lifesavers, or 1 tablespoon of honey. After 15 minutes, check your blood glucose levels again. If it is still low, treat again with one of the carbohydrates listed above, or, if your next meal is more than an hour away, eat a snack that contains both carbohydrates and a protein, such as cheese and crackers. Chapter 13, Taking Care, Mental Health. A diagnosis of diabetes can be frightening. Often the first thing you think about is the complications you might face. Trying to make drastic changes in your lifestyle, the way you eat, your activity level, may seem overwhelming. And you may attempt to cope with all of this by denying your illness. I'm not really a diabetic, I just have a touch of sugar. Give yourself time to understand how your life has changed with diabetes. Allow yourself to grieve or feel anger and guilt over how you might have contributed to the development of your illness. And become aware that when you are ready, you have a great deal of choice in how you will deal with diabetes. Allow yourself small steps in making the changes. Walk a little each day. Aim for three meals a day plus appropriate snacks. 
Don't be angry at yourself if you don't reach your goals at first. Every step is a step in the right direction and will bring you closer to diabetic control. Recognize that prescribed medications don't mean that you are a failure. They are tools to help you to fight for your body, for your health. Don't look at your glucose meter as a judge, providing tests to tell whether you have succeeded or failed. Instead, use these results as information, a guide to help you learn what your body needs and how it responds to the changes you make. And acknowledge the courage you display as you try again tomorrow. Because as long as you are willing to try each day to care for yourself in a loving and responsible fashion, you are working toward diabetic control, and the process itself will improve your health and your state of well-being. Remember, you deserve to care for yourself, and diabetes is an opportunity to remember that. Your body will let you know when you are not caring for yourself and teach you what you need to do if you listen to it. In that way, diabetes really is a second chance to live a long and healthy life. Learning to develop a healthy mental attitude toward your diabetes will reward you in many ways. In people with diabetes, stress can alter blood glucose levels. When someone is highly stressed, they are not as likely to take care of themselves, for example, drinking alcohol or decreasing exercise. They may forget to check their glucose levels or eat well-planned meals regularly, and this can lead to higher blood sugar levels. It is hypothesized that because diabetics may be more sensitive to stress hormones, mental stress can raise glucose levels. Physical stress, such as illness or injury, can also raise those levels. You can determine how stress affects your diabetes by noting your stress level prior to taking a glucose reading. After a week of such notations, you may begin to notice a pattern of stress levels and corresponding blood glucose measures. Learning to relax can have a beneficial effect on blood sugar control. Some suggested ways to do this are breathing exercises. Breathing as deeply as you can and focusing your concentration on your breathing can relax the body. Try this for about 20 minutes at least once a day. Progressive relaxation exercises. Learning to tense and then relax individual muscles can help you to become more aware of where you are holding tension in your body. Many audio tapes and CDs can guide you through these exercises. Exercise. Exercise can help to reduce tension by loosening and stretching your muscles or focusing your energy on a concentrated physical action. You are likely to see significant changes in your blood sugar control. This in turn leads to a more relaxed general mood. Learning to replace negative thoughts with positive ones. Find some ideas, thoughts, stories, or poems that have made you happy in the past. When you're feeling bad, remind yourself of these things that have lifted your mood before. Learn to change sources of stress whenever possible. Find ways to talk with a family member or friend, or review your options if your job has become too stressful. Get support in living with diabetes. You may wish to speak to a counselor or your doctor, or join a support group where you can share your experiences and frustrations with others who understand. Some research has suggested that diabetes doubles the risk of depression. This risk increases with the development of diabetic complications. The effect can create a dangerous cycle for the patient. Depression can lead to poorer physical and mental functioning, which in turn leads to a greater inability to follow a diet or medication plan. Treating depression with psychotherapy and or medication can improve a patient's overall health and ability to manage diabetes. Depression is believed to develop as a result of stress and possibly the metabolic effects of diabetes on the brain. Reducing stress leads to improved mental health and diabetic control. Chapter 14, Additional Notes on Managing Type 1 Diabetes, Formerly Juvenile Onset Diabetes. Your goal will be to keep your blood glucose levels as close to your target range as possible so that you can feel healthy and prevent or delay long-term complications. You will need to learn what causes your blood glucose levels to rise or fall and how you can minimize swings in these levels. Food, stress, and illness will raise your levels while insulin and exercise will lower them. In order to keep your diabetes in control, you will need to learn how your body reacts to each. You can do this by regularly taking readings of these levels with your glucose meter. You will need to inject insulin to deal with the glucose that your blood absorbs after meals. Depending on your regimen of appropriate times to inject insulin, you will need to eat at regular times. Through blood glucose readings, you will learn the way each food affects your levels. Your diet should be healthy, nutritious, and include a variety of foods. Although exercise is important in maintaining good control of your diabetes, you will need to be aware of its effects on your levels and avoid episodes of hypoglycemia when your sugars have gone too low. Working with your doctor to understand how your insulin needs may change during exercise is essential. 
Be aware that illness will have a strong effect on your blood glucose levels and learn how to adapt your insulin regimen to avoid complications. Chapter 15 Additional Notes on Managing Type 2 Diabetes, formerly Late Onset Diabetes. Managing Type 2 Diabetes means focusing on your lifestyle, making healthy food choices, remaining or becoming physically active, taking prescribed medications at appropriate times, learning how to treat hypoglycemia or low blood sugar, reducing stress, not smoking, and minimal use of alcohol are all important components in management of your condition. If you are overweight, you will need to lose weight. You will learn how to test your own blood sugar level so you can learn how your body responds to food, exercise, and stress. Understanding diabetes and what you can do to maintain your health is the cornerstone of managing type 2 diabetes and can prevent a multitude of problems and complications. Working with your doctor, your dietitian, your dentist, and ophthalmologist means that you will have a team with you to help you learn to manage your illness. You may choose to work with a specialist in diabetes, an endocrinologist, as well. For the elderly with diabetes, other problems of aging, including health problems and other necessary medications, can complicate management. Other issues which impact diabetes in the elderly include economic barriers. Seniors on a fixed income may not be able to afford appropriate diabetes care, medications, and proper nutrition. Transportation. Seniors who no longer drive may have difficulty getting to medical appointments or keeping up with preventative care. Mobility. Arthritis and other conditions may make it difficult for seniors to exercise regularly. Isolation. Seniors may have few friends or family to turn to for emotional support as they deal with their diabetes. Communities can help to alleviate these problems through public transportation, meal delivery programs, physical activity programs adapted for seniors, and social programs in senior centers and churches to alleviate isolation. Often, diabetes is undiagnosed in seniors because it is considered part of another disease process. Medications are considered only after diet, exercise, and weight loss have not led to sufficient changes in blood glucose levels. Because of increased sensitivity to medications in the elderly, dosages should be started at a very low level, and blood glucose levels need to be watched carefully. Chapter 16, Exploding Nine Myths of Diabetes. One of the tools for managing diabetes is education, and that includes unlearning many of the things we think we know about diabetes. They include the following. Myth 1. Diabetes is contagious. Diabetes cannot be caught from someone who has the disease. It is a result of the interplay of heredity, genetics, and lifestyle, diet, physical activity, and stress. Myth 2. People with diabetes can't eat sweets. If eaten as part of a healthy meal plan and combined with exercise, desserts can be eaten by people with diabetes. The key is moderation. Myth 3. Eating too much sugar causes diabetes. Although being overweight does increase your risk for developing type 2 diabetes, the illness is caused by a combination of genetic and lifestyle factors. If you have a history of diabetes within your family, a healthy meal plan and exercise may help you to manage your weight. This, in turn, will decrease your risk of developing diabetes. Myth 4. People with diabetes should eat special foods made for diabetics. There is no need to eat special foods. A healthy diet, low in fats, moderate in salt and sugar, and based on whole grain foods, vegetables, and fruits, as well as a variety of protein sources, is all that is necessary. In fact, diabetic versions of sugar-containing foods often still raise blood glucose sugar levels. Myth 5. Diabetics should eat only small amounts of starch foods, such as bread, potatoes, and pasta. Carbohydrates are part of a healthy meal plan. Three to four servings of foods containing carbohydrates are necessary for good nutrition. They provide energy and can be a good source of fiber. Whole grain breads, cereals, pasta, rice, and starchy vegetables like potatoes, yams, peas, and corn can be included in your meals in appropriate sized portions. Myth 6. People with diabetes are more likely to get colds and other illnesses. Although most diabetics are no more likely to get colds or other illnesses than other people, they are advised to get flu shots. The reason for this is that any infection interferes with blood glucose management. So, in order to maintain good control of blood sugars, it is best to avoid common infections such as the flu. Myth 7. Insulin causes weight gain. Because obesity is bad for you, you should not take insulin. Research has shown that the benefit of glucose management with insulin is greater than any risk of weight gain. Myth 8. Fruit is healthy and you can eat as much as you wish. It is true that fruit is a healthy food containing fiber and vitamins. Because it contains carbohydrates, it needs to be included in an appropriate meal plan. A dietitian can help you determine the amount of fruit you can eat per day. Myth 9. 
Unless your A1C is greater than 8%, you don't need to change your diabetic management. Research has shown that the better your glucose control, the less likely you are to develop complications of diabetes. This means that fine-tuning your control is essential. The American Diabetes Association lists under 7% as a goal for good diabetic control. The closer your level is to a non-diabetic range, under 6%, the lower your chances of complications. If you have type 1 diabetes, you may need guidance from your doctor to determine the best target goal for you to avoid hypoglycemia or low blood sugar complications. Chapter 17, A Day in the Life. Well, that was a lot of information to absorb, wasn't it? It's time to put it all into perspective. What does it mean to be a healthy diabetic? Let's look at a day in the life of one diabetic. Although the facts of Susan's life are fictional, her diabetes management can serve as a guide for newly diagnosed diabetics. Susan is in her early 50s and was diagnosed as a type 2 diabetic three years ago. Her father and grandfather were both diabetic, and she knew her risk to develop this disease was high. At the time of diagnosis, she was about 30 pounds overweight, but she has slowly been taking the weight off and is now about 5 pounds over her weight loss goal. Although never particularly active physically, in the last three years she has explored new ways to increase her activity. Her doctor has prescribed metformin to help with her diabetic control, as well as low levels of medication to maintain her target cholesterol and blood pressure readings. She is married, has two grown children and a dog, and works part-time in an insurance office as a receptionist. Susan sees her doctor every three months. He reviews her blood glucose readings and takes an A1C test to get a better idea of her blood glucose levels over the last three months. They discuss her meal plan, activity, and stress levels, and any concerns she may have. She sees her dentist twice a year and her ophthalmologist once a year. Because of this and her self-care, she is able to maintain healthy teeth and gums, and her eyes have also remained healthy. It is morning. Susan wakes up after an eight-hour sleep. She knows that a good night's sleep helps her to feel well and able to care for herself throughout the day. She takes a fasting blood glucose test and is pleased to see that her sugars are within her target goal. As she prepares her breakfast, she thinks about her plans for the day. Her breakfast consists of orange juice, oatmeal, poached egg with one slice toast, milk, and then she relaxes over a cup of green tea. She takes her metformin and makes sure to put her lunchtime medication and a source of quick sugar to treat hypoglycemia into her purse. After showering, gently patting herself dry, examining her feet and skin for bruises and cuts, and putting on a lotion to keep her skin moist, she flosses and brushes her teeth, gets dressed, and heads off to work. She has decided to treat herself today and so does not pack a lunch. Sometimes it's important just to share a meal time out with friends, and that is what she plans to do today. As lunchtime nears, she takes out her other test kit that she leaves in her desk drawer at work and checks her blood glucose level. It is getting low and she knows it will soon be time to eat. The apple she had at 10 a.m. is beginning to disappear, and she's hungry. She calls her friend, and they make plans to meet at the cafeteria across the street. She prefers places where she can have many choices for her food, and this cafeteria has wonderful salads and other enticing treats. When she gets there, she orders the following for lunch. Chicken soup with vegetables, salad with non-fat dressing, chicken cutlet and noodles served with cooked tomatoes and a sprinkling of Parmesan cheese, a slice of whole grain bread lightly buttered, small slice of watermelon, a cup of plain yogurt. As she enjoys her meal and catches up with the latest news her friend has to share, she swallows her metformin with water and continues her lunchtime break. Her food was great. She is full and relaxed and ready to work again. She's happy she was able to arrange a part-time job because it gives her more time to get in some exercise. At 3 p.m. she walks over to the gym where she has developed a program that includes a brisk walk on the treadmill and some time on several weight-bearing machines. She brings along her favorite music and when she tires of that, she talks to the woman on the next treadmill. She enjoys letting the exercise ease all the tensions of the working day, and sometimes even enjoys the experience of sweating and just letting herself be. Because she has watched her blood sugar levels closely, she is aware of her need for something to eat immediately after exercise, and reminds herself of the orange she is carrying in her workout bag. After a 50-minute workout and a quick shower and snack, she heads home to prepare dinner and spend a relaxing evening with her husband. Tonight, dinner will include spinach salad with sliced tomatoes on the side, poached salmon, rice prepared with chicken broth, peas and pearl onions, berry plate for dessert. She has tested twice today, so she decides not to test before dinner. 
However, she is curious about how her exercise and meal choices have affected her levels, and so reminds herself to do one final test before she has her bedtime snack. After dinner and her final medication for the day, she and her husband share some time together. During the evening, she takes twenty minutes for herself to write in her journal and practice some deep breathing to quiet music. She finds that this helps to keep her stress levels down, and she delights in this special time for herself. Sipping an herbal tea, she and her husband watch the sunset, and she then goes into the kitchen to prepare a bedtime snack, a turkey sandwich she divides in two to share with him. She remembers to check her sugars one more time as she had wanted to, and then nibbles at her sandwich and drinks a glass of milk. She feels good, healthy, relaxed, and ready to sleep, and proud that she is able to take care of herself so well. She deserves it. Being a diabetic is hard at times, but taking care of herself is worth it. And she has come to appreciate the health she has discovered since the day of her diagnosis. She has come to see that day as the beginning of her second chance. Your issues may be different. Your diet, activity level, and medications will be determined by both you and your doctor. And there will be difficult days when you feel overwhelmed by the reality of your diabetes. You can't just forget it. Put off eating because you're too busy. Give up on exercise because it's too boring. Ignore the building signs of stress. Your diabetes will remind you that you need to pay attention. But you know what? Paying attention isn't so bad, really. It gives you a chance to really care for yourself, in your own way and with the support of your medical team. Because you're worth it too. And for many of us, diabetes really is a second chance.